Hi, my name is Mark Parkinson, and I'm the president and CEO of the American Healthcare Association and the National Center for Assisted Living. And this is the first in a series of videos where we're going to update you on what's happening with COVID-19 from DC, but really more important, what you should be doing or could be doing in your buildings. I've never been more honored to be the president and CEO of this organization. We know how hard you're fighting against this virus and fighting for our staff and for our residents every single day. And we want to do everything that we can to support you. And that's what this series of videos is all about. So I'll start out and very briefly let you know what's happening in DC. But really the more important part of these videos will be hearing from Dr. David Gifford, who I'll introduce in just a minute. And GIF, our chief medical officer, will be answering questions that we're getting from members about what they need to be doing to fight the COVID virus. So first, let me give the very brief DC update. We're doing fine in DC uh, on both the regulatory side and on the financial side, uh, we've been winning. CMS has been accommodating most of our requests. As you know, they followed our guidance to restrict visitors out of our buildings. They've repurposed the survey process so that there's no more annual surveys. And they finally issued guidance that allows us to preserve the limited amount of equipment that we have. So we feel like we're making good progress with CMS and with the CDC. On the financial side, we've also had some success. Congress passed a bill last week that will provide $35 billion to the states to increase Medicaid payments. And just today, Congress is doing the final work on the huge stimulus bill that will increase our Medicare rates and will create a fund where hopefully we're going to be able to access dollars for every assisted living building and skilled nursing building in the country. We know that winning in DC is not enough. The real battle right now is in the buildings and this really challenging battle that we have against COVID-19. Fortunately, our chief medical officer is the leading expert on nursing home quality in the country, an incredibly impressive person, board certified geriatrician on the faculty at Brown and Ivy League School, and we're lucky to have him as our full-time head. So, Giff, I've really propped you up there, um, but it's all certainly valid, and we're so pleased and happy that you're with us during this battle. Why don't you have a few comments, and then we're gonna have some questions that will primarily deal with what to do once COVID is in your building. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, you know, we're hearing from a number of you out there about how hard and, and challenging it is. You're running out of PPE, uh, uh, looking at different ways to do that. You're getting pressure from the hospitals to take admissions uh, uh, with individuals with COVID. Your staff are out sick. You're worried about your family members as well. It's a really tough time out there. And uh, we're trying to get any information we can. As Mark said, uh, the cavalry is going to be coming uh, later, but there's some steps we need to do between now and then. So, so Gif, once someone finds out that COVID is in one of their buildings, what are the first few things that they should do? Well, I think there's three things you can do. First is isolate that person so they don't contact with other residents and try to minimize it with staff contact. <clears throat> Similarly, now you have to assume it's in your building. I would really try to keep as many residents in their room as possible and limit the contact with other residents and other staff which then leads to the second step, which is minimize interaction with the staff as much as possible. Think about and explore options uh, with uh, ways of sort of uh, consistent assignment where the same staff are seeing the same residents, so they're not uh, potentially moving between residents. And then I know everyone's worrying about it right now, but just double down on the contact precautions and washing your hands uh, and uh, using the gowns and gloves. And if the person who's infected, put a mask on them so that when they're coughing, they don't spread the droplets. Yeah, Gif, that's, that all sounds like great advice, but one of the problems that we've had is people have had trouble just even getting tests. You know, what, what do you do if you have COVID positive folks in your buildings and you can't get tests, or if you suspect that people have COVID and you can't get tests, what should you do? So we're hearing that from a lot of members because there just aren't enough tests out there. Hopefully that'll rectify itself in the, in the coming weeks. Um, but you just need to assume that the people who have fever and cough or sore throat at this time probably have COVID. And I would just act as if they have COVID. Um, and even if you're waiting for a test result, you need to act as if they have COVID until the test result comes back. So while you're waiting for the test result, you isolate them, you keep a mask on them, you do all the stuff with staff that you previously described. 
And then the final question for today's segment has to do with um, the equipment problem. You know, people continue to have problems getting equipment. What do you do, particularly if you have a COVID positive resident and you can't get equipment? Does the, does the government then come step in and help or what, what happens? So we're hearing that and that that is probably the thing that's keeping me up at night and I know many of you up at night as well. First, if you haven't tried, call your state health department. They do uh, have some limited supply. So a lot of it's going to hospitals and some of the EMS, but I would definitely call them and they're the ones who are gonna be getting the national stockpile. Uh, after that, you really need to figure out how to extend the supply you have. Manufacturing is coming back online, so we will see more, but it probably won't be for another four to six weeks. So you should assume that what you have or what you may get from your supplier or from the state has to keep you going for about another four to six weeks. So you're gonna to have to come up with creative solutions. The CDC is giving guidance on how to use uh, masks and gowns in more creative ways, um, but then we have members who are really coming up with creative ways and exploring how to make masks and make gowns as well. And so you need to think and plan for the worst, which is that what you have on hand is what you need to go for another four to six weeks, and if that won't last, you need to figure out how to begin to make them. We also would ask the community for donations. There are a lot of isolated small amounts of masks and gowns in the community, and so I would turn to social media, uh, whatever, Facebook, whatever you can, and ask for donations. And Gif, we have, we have websites set up that provide more complete information on all of these questions about what to do if COVID's in your building, what to do if you can't get testing, what to do if you can't get equipment. So I would just encourage um, all of the folks that are watching the video to go to the website for that more complete information. And we also have a link on the website to a dedicated uh, email account where you can submit questions that we will then use as the basis for future videos. It looks like we're gonna do this maybe a couple of times a week. Uh, and so submit those questions and Giff and I will discuss them on future videos. In the meantime, just continue to do the great work that we're doing. The work that you're doing is saving people's lives. As I said before, it's such an honor to be working on your behalf right now. We're not gonna give up. We know you're not gonna give up and eventually we're gonna make it to the other side of this. Thank you all so much.